Welcome to Smith's Interconnect 360 Connectivity Podcast. Join our experts as they explore high-end and cutting-edge topics that shape and influence the connectivity world. Enjoy this week's episode. Welcome to Smith's Interconnect 360 Connectivity Podcast, the podcast that explores the connectivity trends and applications in today's market. I'm Kim Haas, a sales engineer at Smith's Interconnect, and today I'm talking with Kevin DeFord, who's our Senior Product Commercial Manager. In this episode, we're going to be diving into understanding what spring probes and interposers are and the advantages that they have over other board-to-board Interconnect technologies. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Kim. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, good to, good to chat with you. So what is an interposer? So the interposers are a, a unique style of connector that helps transfer signals between printed circuit boards more efficiently. You know, think of an interposer as an electrical bridge between two cir- printed circuit boards or PCBs. Rather than soldering mating male and female connectors directly to the PCB, interposers, interposers use compliant spring probes to carry the signals, eliminating the use of solder in the manufacturing process. Interposers are ideal for mixed signal applications and designed specifically for the application's environment. Can you tell me a little bit more? So an interposer is an alternative to a traditional pin and socket connector. It's a one-piece compression-mounted solderless connector that transmits signals between two PCBs vertically through a spring probe contact. Interposers are made from a plastic housing, typically a peak, ultim, uh, there's a variety of engineering plastics. Within that housing, we use high reliability spring probes, which are populated to the board's specific footprint to accommodate the signals being passed. They are ideal for integrating mixed signals as you can have a single interposer carrying RF, high-speed digital, and power. So I guess I don't know much about a spring probe. What can you tell me about those? So a spring probe is an electrical contact, uh, usually made from three or four components. So you have a barrel, a, a plunger, and a spring, and some, in some cases, we incorporate a ball. The barrel is the outer part of the spring probe that houses the spring and the plunger. The plunger slides inside the barrel to make physical contact with the PCB pad and the barrel, completing the electrical circuit. In some designs, we use two there's one at each end to make the electrical circuit. In other cases, the barrel itself acts as the opposite end of the uh, of the electrical connection. The spring is inside the barrel and provides the force plunger, which contacts the barrel on the inside and completes the connection to the opposing PCB, completing the electrical circuit. It is important to note that the spring is not designed to be part of the electrical path. If a ball is used, it is placed inside the barrel between the spring and the plunger and it ensures a more stable contact for electrical connection. So how do you do that? How do you ensure a stable contact between the plunger and barrel? So that's an interesting question. Um, so part of what differentiates Smith spring probes from others are the internal biasing techniques that we integrate into our probe designs. So these Techniques are part of our IP and ensure that the spring components make contact internally in a way that ensures that the signal flows directly from the board through the plunger to the barrel and to the other mating board. So depending on the application's requirements, there are different considerations Smith makes when selecting a particular probe design for the interposer. One technique is used for applications that have very high current requirements but require fewer than 10,000 mating cycles. It's a more aggressive bias but you know results in a beefier probe design to meet those high current requirements. Another bias style is used for applications requiring longer life uh, as spring probes can typically survive you know more than 50,000 mating cycles. So spring probes aren't new to the industry. Um, we've been using them for decades in, in the ATE and board test arena. So in early 2000, Smiths began designing them into interconnects that transmit signals between a, a, a larger, more complex motherboard to a daughter card 
uh, in ATE tests. Later in the same decade, we began designing them into OEM applications, and hence the interposer was born. So what kind of advantages would you see using an interposer as compared to another style of connector and board-to-board -board applications? Yeah, so spring probe interposer autonomous interconnects that generally have more compliance than other interposer designs, such as you know, bent metal contacts, which typically have a, a shorter working range. So another advantage is improved efficiency in manufacturing for our customers. There are many ways that a customer can integrate an interposer into the final assembly, and most of our customers' applications use compression mounting as it completely eliminates the use of solder in assembly, reducing costs and process time. So you know, with compression mounting, an interposer is mounted between two PCBs, which have other fixing methods or external hardware that compress the PCBs to each other, thus you know, compressing the interposer. So we do see in some applications, you know, customer wishes to solder to the board directly on one side of the interposer. In this case, the probe's barrel is designed to have a, a land on it for surface mount soldering. We also have some designs uh, with a solid pin for through hole soldering, or a solder cup can be uh, integrated into the design for wiring in a connector application. Primarily, we see compression mounting as the preference for the advantages it provides in end manufacturing. Okay, that, that's interesting. Uh, what other advantages are there? Okay, um, so interposers are field serviceable. They could be installed and reinstalled multiple times in a system without harming them. In some applications, the, the interposer is designed to be fixed on a motherboard and the daughter cards can be assembled onto the connector for different upgrades, you know, applications or even missions. So another advantage is that you know, interposers are completely customizable and you know configured at multiple heights, shapes, and sizes. And a single interposer can be designed to span multiple board stack heights. They can be machined or molded into shapes to traverse all kinds of geometries. So one last advantage is that you can have multiple spring pins designed into the interposer to carry power in one section, high-speed RF signals in another, and high-speed digital signals in yet another area of the interposer. So this is a question that I get really a lot. Um, how, how do interposers perform in the high-speed and RF applications? So the, the answer is it depends. So in RF applications, you have a signal return path. The two together with some dielectric in between them have an impedance. So the RF performance will always depend on the system impedance and the impedance of the interconnect. So when signals go from A to B, um, it, everything will depend on how well those signal transitions from board to interposer to PCB match. Spring probes have good geometry control and they can make excellent R RF conductors. In our case, it would be two pins, you know, signal return, or it could be a signal pin with many returns and an array. The RF performance will depend on how you arrange the pins and the spacing in between them. There's some other factors, you know, such as conductor and dielectric losses, but impedance control is generally the biggest concern. So when crosstalk is a concern, more pins can be added to prevent signals from straying over to other RF sections of the interposer. All of these things are considered at the design phase of the interposer. And we use 3D EM software to determine the signal and return pin placement for performance. So in high-speed digital applications, you have two signal pins and a return path. I won't get into digital or differential signaling too much today. That would be a topic for another day. So, but essentially the same rules apply for differential design. And the RF example above is one of the signals go down the lane, the, you know, the voltage is coupled to the return. Same applies for differential signaling, except for now you have two signal conductors and there's coupling between them that have to be considered in design. So interposers can be designed to match any system impedance uh, by changing the pin spacing return pin placement, whether it's 
85 ohms, 90 ohms, 100 ohms, whatever the case may be. So here's a big question. What about cost? How much, how much are these? Yeah, so, you know, solderless center posers have a lower cost of ownership than other solder connector solutions. So that has to be uh, into the equation. Interposers are usually integrated into assembly after all other processes that have been completed. You know, for example, during a PCB assembly, you could take it through multiple soldering and cleaning processes. If you have connectors that are soldered, you might have to mask them off to protect them during the cleaning and wave soldering to prevent the, you know, ingress and damage. Flux and other contaminants can get washed into the connector and lay dormant for days, weeks, months, even years and become active again when exposed to the right environments. So with an interposer, you, you kind of avoid all of that. You avoid soldering altogether so they can be installed at final system integration after the PCBs have seen all those processes that I mentioned earlier. So what's the best way to get started? Okay, that's, a, that's an easy question. So, you know, the first step is to contact a Smith sales representative to to discuss your application requirements. So that would lead to a discussion about performance, electrical, mechanical, environmental requirements. You know, we have an internal repository of hundreds of spring pin designs, and the ideal one would be selected for the specific application requirements. You know, and the discussions really kick off from there. Yeah, that, that's when things really get exciting. Kevin, thanks for uh, taking time to talk about this. I really appreciate it and think this would probably help folks understand interposers a little bit better. Thanks again. All right. Thank you, Kim. That's all for this week's episode of Smith's Interconnect 360 Connectivity Podcast. We hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to reach out to us through the form in our podcast webpage. Stay tuned for the next episodes in which we'll explore more topics related to connectivity solutions. Thank you for listening and have a great day.